I'm so excited and I just can't hide it. I'm about to lose control and I think I like it. Yeah, yeah, because look at this thing. <laughs> Welcome to the patio. This is my Mermaco Cattleya Louise Fuchs purple at the end of May with two new growths starting. But the big surprise is check this new growth out <laughs> on the 1st of July. I mean, goodness me, this is insanity. And I am so happy to be able to report back to the person that gifted this orchid to me, Fernanda Nathimento Orchids and Succulents. Look, she is doing fabulously. <laughs> the size of this new growth, even at the base, is super scary in a good way. And for that reason, we're going to repot her. This orchid provides me with two cycles of root growth, and the first cycle that comes out is always at a very iffy time. But now we are seeing signs of more root growth, so I'm just going to go in. And my intention in this repot is to just at a bare minimum, address the root system so that she has enough aeration for the coming years so that I don't have to disturb her anymore because if by chance this orchid blooms for us, then I want it to be in the new pot, the much, much bigger pot that I have allocated for her so as not to disturb her should she come into spike. And seeing as I can just lift this orchid out, just buy her structures, pot, and everything comes along with it, of course, she is rock hard, which is great news because most of the time when that happens, that means we've got viable roots. If the roots in there were dead because of my cold winters, then there would be a bit more flex in the pot. So this is encouraging, it's hammer time. But we're not gonna go bonkers all throughout the pot. We're just gonna target the lower part of the pot because if I'm going to do damage there by squeezing and mushing all the roots together, then I can at least cut those away and not risk any of the fresh roots growing at the surface. And they may be somewhat longer than I would appreciate, but it is now or never because this is also the right time of year to repot this orchid, seeing as she's a warm to hot grower. And well, my winters aren't exactly warm. And her setup being lekker and self-watering, this orchid has to deal with evaporative cooling. The lowest temperatures that she should have, if at all, being a warm to hot grower, are 15 degrees Celsius. I can do that when it comes to ambient air, but that doesn't mean that that is the temperature in the pot because of lekker and evaporative cooling, dropping the temperature down even further. And for that reason, let me tell you something. These roots may look nasty and they may have an appearance of being dead, but they are not. And I'm absolutely loving the fact that there are so many viable roots in this pot. Yay! So I'm going to clean her up and give you some care tips about this orchid, or let's just say Myrmacocatlias in general. And you can see uh, that some of the new roots are already way down into the pot. Those were the ones that grew during a time of year where repotting this orchid is not advisable in my conditions but they are there. So we're going to be very careful with those. So what my intention is, is just to get at all the roots that look dead. Hopefully not make a mistake and cut into a viable one just because it looks dead. Give this orchid some more space aeration for the fantastic roots this amazing, amazing new growth will produce. And hopefully we can bring the second new growth through. And while I continue to fiddle with the root system, please be so kind as to give this video a thumbs up. Let the algorithm know that this channel exists. And if you have not subscribed to the channel, consider yourself welcome. Your vote of confidence is greatly appreciated as well as the support that goes hand in hand with your subscription. Thank you so, so much. So this orchid is a cross of Myrmacophila tibicinis, which I have, and Cattleya bicolor which I also have. Both of them have not bloomed for us on the patio. Being that we have two species in the parents, it is considered a primary hybrid. And you can see where the purple coloring, the anthocyanin comes from. When you look at the Myrmacocatlia, the Tibicinus is a burgundy, completely burgundy. And she doesn't lose much of that burgundy color even if she were to be in more shade. I wonder if I will ever get my Tibicinus to bloom. Meanwhile, she is a fun orchid to grow. <laughs> And no, I do not have any ant colonies in those structures, even though that is what Mimicophilas do, 
And thankfully, I do not have any ant colonies around the structures or in the structures of my Myrmoco cattleya. And I say it like that because I have enough ants to deal with on the patio. If they're not going to populate and create a harmonious relationship with the orchids where they should be going, then I don't want them in there because they're causing enough issues on orchids where they shouldn't be going. Which is really strange because having the TBCs in the parentage, you would think that the Myrmoco cattleya would then also be very ideal for ants because it's also quite the happy sap producer. But anyway, I've got my bicolor here as well, one of her parents, and this orchid for the first time is showing a sheath, which I will consider a blind sheath. She is practicing, but she has made substantial progress as well since she arrived on the patio. Now, I hope that this is a bicolor, <laughs> because bicolors are not supposed to be bifoliates, but the last two growths are bifoliates. Well, and the last growth, the one that is just showing that sheath, my word, what a size jump. Which brings me to something that was addressed in a live stream, which I want to reiterate in this video. I was asked in a live stream, what does it take to get an orchid to bloom? And why do some bloom and others don't, even though they've been longer in the collection? And we know that light is always a factor. We always advise that if an orchid is supposed to be blooming size and it is not blooming, give it more light. Well, you can give an orchid that is not blooming size all the light that the orchid can handle, she still won't bloom until she has all the energy according to her to be able to grow spikes and actually support any kind of blooming that the orchid would have. So that is what has been going on with my Mimicocatlia. The thing is that every new growth, we are trying to develop more structures. So with an orchid like this, that is very energy consuming, she is going to need a lot of structures in order to have the energy to bloom. But with every new growth, for example, not including the ones we may lose down the line because of rot, every new growth brings new roots, which then provides another layer of energy because the orchid can then absorb more nutrients. So it's like a layer cake. You need the structures in order for the orchid to grow roots in order for the orchid to take up more energy to grow another structure and then you can increase the fertilizer so that there's a bigger growth with more roots and so on and so forth. And that is what we're working towards, not just with seedlings or the near blooming size orchids that we get into our collection new. We are creating layer upon layer of energy, which then will be able to support blooms. And that takes time in the orchid hobby to achieve, which we all know. Considering the size jump of this new growth, I am seriously wondering if this one doesn't bloom for us and I can keep up with what I'm intending to do with this repot by 2025, 2026, this orchid should be blooming. Unless, of course, then another factor kicks in, my conditions may just not be ideal. I referenced temperature and thankfully she is in active growth during a time of year where I can be aggressive with all the fertilizing that she needs and I strongly believe that the reason that this new growth and hopefully the second one will continue to grow is because I pumped her full of calcium nitrate the moment I saw her with her first root growth activity earlier in the year. Anything that has to do with Mirma, it loves calcium. They are really into calcium and they need it because these growths grow fast. <laughs> And in order for them not to collapse and be all weak and bendy bendy, the calcium helps them to grow strong. And usually the spikes on these orchids are pretty long. So if there were to be a spike, that also needs to be supported. It's a massive calcium absorbing machine, anything Myrmico. So Myrmicophila, Myrmicocatlia. Then there's Myrmicatavola as well, which I have the Francis Fox. Let's just say anything that starts with M Y R M. -E. E, think calcium. So that is why I believe this progress is the way it is at this time with my orchid. So my first focus is the calcium and then I go to calcium magnesium because of all the light that she wants and she can photosynthesize better because of the magnesium. And then I start when the temperatures are a little bit more in her favor. In my conditions, I start with fertilizer and the quantities usually are 300 parts per million of calcium nitrate of CalMag 
and then I go in with 500 parts per million of my orchid fertilizer, the one that has all the micronutrients in it as well. And if there were to be salt buildup at the surface of the pot, because of the amount I throw into this pot, none of the green moss that has developed over the years would survive, it would burn out. So everything quantity wise is proving to be absolutely required and very welcome by this orchid. Now because I'm going into a much much bigger pot, I don't want to exacerbate and stress this root ball out. I want the new roots that were growing earlier in the season to make it and not collapse on me because we still have a ways to go before the next growth starts its new root system. So from a 15 centimeter pot, my orchid is going into a 22 centimeter square pot and she is going bang smack in the middle because yes, even though it is tiny and it's very slow, I do have a lead in the back. So that would be three leads that this orchid has. Which brings me to the topic of light. <laughs> This orchid needs a lot of light, but she doesn't want to have any kind of direct sun that would burn the leaves, of course. That is usually the norm. So she is on the east side, which is getting a little bit crowded with all these bumping up of pot sizes, but needs must and a gifted orchid takes precedence and will cross the road when it comes to space during the winter, which I don't want to think about at this point in time. That is a configuration I'll figure out when it is time to. For now, we're just going to enjoy what is going on at the, on the patio. It is important though for a pot this size to ensure that all the water actually wicks up. I want to point out that I'm really paying attention to where is the base of the existing root ball in relation to the reservoir. Because the pot is so much bigger, that root ball is nowhere near the reservoir even though I've got microfiber in the pot in order to draw the moisture up. So just filling the reservoir is not going to be good enough. I have to fill it up a little bit more so that the pot literally settles on the water in order to get the water level even higher so that the current root system has access to that water and doesn't struggle to get at the nutrients. Normally my reservoirs are only filled so that the microfibers touch them and then wick the water up. But in this case, and if you have a similar situation, it is super important to get that water to the existing root system until new roots or branching root tips find their way down further into the pot proper. With all that being said, if you have any questions at all, please bring them to my attention in the comments. Even if you don't have any questions, I love hearing from you. Just say hi. Let me know how you're doing. Let me know how your orchids are doing. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for spending time with me on the patio. I so appreciate you. The support is amazing. And because you watched to the end, I get to wish you a beautiful day on the condition, though, please, that you stay safe. Take care. Bye.